Welcome to the Geospatial Frontier Virtual Technology Fair, hosted and created by Project Geospatial and partnered with the American Geographical Society. For what you're about to watch, it is my honor to introduce the moderator for the Workforce Innovation Enabling New Environments panel, Dr. Cynthia Mendoza. Dr. Cynthia Mendoza currently serves as the IC Chief Architect and the Director of the Architecture and Integration Division for the Office of the IC Chief Information Officer at the ODNI. She is responsible for the scalable IC enterprise architecture used to drive interoperability, intelligence integration efficiencies, and opportunities encompassing all IC environments. She is a native of San Antonio, Texas, and has more than 30 years of experience leading government and industry organizations. Her prior assignments include serving as the Director of Requirements Analysis within the Systems and Resource Analysis Program and Requirements Division Office under the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency's Information Management Program Architect and Advisor, and NGA Chief Engineer and Director of the Architecture and Engineering Group. Dr. Mendoza's 20 years of industry experience, including Vice President of Operations for Galactic Technologies in San Antonio, Texas, where she led efforts on commercial and government contracts, including services to the Air Force Intelligence Agency. She holds a Bachelor's in Science in Electrical Engineering from Texas A&M University and a Master's in Science and PhD in Systems Engineering and Engineering Management from the George Washington University. Now that you know a little bit about our moderator, I'm going to pass the baton to her as she carries the discussion forward in introducing our panelists. Thank you, Adam. Howdy and good morning. Thank you for joining us today. Time is valuable, so we truly appreciate your participation. The purpose of this session is to have a valuable discussion around workforce innovation, enabling new environments. Due to the dynamics of the environment, Due to the we would like to discuss opportunities to enable secure capabilities. In other words, hashtag work from home. So we wanna talk about how we can improve business continuity for the workforce and how we can make these collaboration capabilities easily deployable, hence strengthening low side capabilities. The current posture is fundamentally changing the way we do business. Today, we have three panel members with us to help drive discussion around this topic. Our first panel member is Mr. Patrick Atchison from Quadrant. Patrick is one of the co-founders and managing principals of Quadrant. Patrick has extensive experience as a system architect and program manager. He has managed a significant number of systems integration programs including commercial off-the-shelf software implementations, data center migrations, and application migrations to the cloud. He has managed teams operating a portfolio of applications across a wide variety of platforms. Variety of Patrick has also managed multiple enterprise resource planning implementations and upgrades across multiple federal and commercial customers. Prior to forming Quadrant, Patrick worked as a director of enterprise resource planning at Maverick Technologies and as a consultant with Accenture. Before he began in technology, Patrick also worked at the Department of Justice. He holds a master's degree in public administration from New York University's Robert F. Wagner School of Public Service and a bachelor's degree from Fordham University. Now I'd like to introduce our next panel member. Mr. John Lewington from the National Security Group, Adobe Federal. He is an industry specialist and has 20 plus years of experience working with GEOINT and Intel Community, Department of Homeland Security and Law Enforcement, and international partners. Previously, Mr. Lewington managed sales, global professional services, strategy and business development, and product engineering for a variety of commercial enterprise cybersecurity and secure information sharing technologies. With Adobe, Mr. Lewington is advising customers on digital transformation and protecting critical information through data-centric security solutions. Our last but not least panel member, Mr. David Sterling with Royce Geo. Dave Sterling, founder and CEO of Royce Geospatial Consultants, has spent the last 17 years within the U.S. geospatial intelligence community, 
creating advanced tradecraft, designing data systems, and building teams to solve our nation's intelligence issues within the geospatial intelligence sector. Sterling's ambition for business and solving hard problems is what helped him launch Royce Geo, a company focused on providing unique solutions to federal agencies and military partners. Prior to launching Royce Geo, Sterling served as a deputy division manager and business development lead for Key W Corp's Geospatial Services Division and as a senior geospatial analyst for NGA. Sterling has a BS degree in geography and geosciences from Salisbury University and an MS degree in geography, GIS from Virginia Tech. Now you have met the panel members, so we'll take three to five minutes for each panel, panel member to offer their perspectives about enabling workforce innovation. Then I'll facilitate a dynamic question and answer session. So first, we'll start out with Patrick Atchison with Crodwin. Patrick? Good morning. First of all, I just want to say thank you to Dr. Mendoza for moderating this event and thank you to Adam for putting it together. I appreciate the opportunity to be on this panel with uh, Dave and John, who I've had the opportunity to work with before, so appreciate that. I thought maybe I'd just start talking about uh, kind of some of the stuff we've experienced with um, moving into this virtual environment uh, that we're experiencing with uh, the, the current uh, climate. We primarily work in a, the cleared space in the Intel community and have had um, most of our uh, workforce uh, on client sites in a, a classified environment prior to uh, dealing with this um, event. So for us, there was a lot of activity that we had to deal with uh, to kind of get the workforce uh, enabled uh, in an unclassified environment. And I would say um, there's a couple of key points I think we'll talk about throughout the discussion, but certainly the, the first and foremost thing we had to deal with was just getting the collaboration capabilities on the low side for folks, both from a corporate perspective, because we have a corporate staff that uses and is familiar with a lot of the collaboration tools, but um, all of our um, client-facing personnel generally Primarily, we're just using the customer collaboration tools in the classified environment. So uh, it took us a little bit of effort to get um, everybody uh, up to speed and leveraging a lot of the, the commercial collaboration capabilities, things like um, Teams and uh, other uh, tools like that. And then uh, I would say the second thing we would probably work the most with is um, all of our customers were great about trying to figure out how to do work on the low side, but uh, we did spend a fair amount of time and effort having to have discussions up front about what could and could not be done on the low side. And I think that um, was an area where uh, we were a little reactive in terms of uh, determining what things might um, uh, be worked or work that could be done on the low side. Fortunately, I think we're getting past that and we're seeing a lot more stuff uh, than I think we initially thought uh, that could be actually uh, work performed in an unclassified environment for, for our customers, which has been um, great. Uh, I think coming with that, though, there's certainly been uh, a lot of time and effort put into the need for additional infrastructure um, and uh, environments on the, the unclassified side. I know Royce and others have done uh, quite a bit of work in, in the area of, of enabling that stuff for various customers. The big thing there we found is that uh, even though we could do a lot of stuff in the unclassified environment, most of our customers have taken the approach that they still want to try to keep the work with their uh, footprint. So uh, they've had to uh, do a, a lot in terms of enabling uh, low side capability um, for all of the, the the workforce. And I think that's been, again, uh, going pretty well now, but it was a bit, I think, of a struggle early on in the process. I would say that probably the third thing we've kind of wrestled with uh, both on the corporate side, and I think our customers are wrestling with this on the, um, on, on the, the, the client side is just the security. So, uh, you know, leveraging these tools, there are a lot of available tools on the on the open 
internet and open source stuff? And um, how do you make sure we're picking tools that are secure uh, and, and provide the right uh, level of security? And I think um, that's an issue that we are working through on the corporate side. Uh, and I think that's an issue that a lot of our customers have grappled with uh, is making sure that um, uh, low side work is secure. And certainly in the environment we work in, I think that's a key key element. So uh, I guess I'll stop there for now and, and, and allow the other panelists to kind of talk about some of their stuff. Well, thank you, Patrick. We'll move on now to John with Adobe Federal. Hi, thank you, Cynthia, for having me on this panel, and, and Adam, and, and David, and Patrick. I look forward to your insights as, as this continues. So you, you probably know Adobe. The name's pretty uh, well-known in industry, probably from PDF and, and Photoshop. What you may not know what, as well is what we do from a digital experience perspective. When you're interacting online, buying a car, doing banking, shopping, you know, hotels, travel reservations, probably most likely you're using our Adobe Experience platform. Uh, um, but when you look at the public sector space and what we've gone through recently with transitioning to work from home, there's a lot of challenges that we're very familiar with just because in 2011, we really made a push towards the cloud and really enabling people to work from home as well as taking advantages of what technology provides. Probably the, the, the biggest concern that we've been interacting with clients over the last two months is really the security of their content, right? So working from home, people are accessing information from government organizations that, you know, contain sensitive, maybe it's PII, maybe it's some sort of high value asset, maybe it's sensitive. Um, and the, the, the problem is, you know, you might not think about it and say, okay, I've attached a document and I put it in my email and my email is encrypted because I've used a CAT card. What happens on the other end when that person downloads that content or before they even attach it to the email, it's sitting on a hard drive or it's on a server someplace, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud. And so we've been, we've been talking to a lot of different clients on how do they maintain and manage their client or content. For example, you know, you know what happens if uh, you need to revoke access to that content? How do you restrict printing of that content, modifying it? You know, where, what happens if that content gets sent to a number of different people or even thousands of people, right? And, and, and then how do you pull it back? It's really difficult operating in these different cloud environments. And I think, you know, as, as we move to more of a virtual environment from home, these challenges will become, you know, to the fore, forefront more and more as certain security considerations. You know, I didn't think about it. You know, I got a new um, uh, internet connection to my house. The router showed up. And I open up the box to implement the router and they say, comes from Verizon. Hey, this router contains open source software and we're, we're basically not liable for it. Okay, well that's, that's a new threat vector that in most cases we haven't really had to consider. And so I think what you'll see and what a big focus from Adobe has been besides you know, doing virtual meetings through Adobe Connect is how do you protect, how do you share that vital content uh, across different organizations easily and seamlessly. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Cynthia. Yes, thank you. Thank you, John, I appreciate that. Now we move on to Dave with Royce Geo. Thank you, Cynthia. And I'll uh, echo uh, Patrick and John's comments. Thanks to Adam and you for uh, putting this on. Um, we, uh, Royce Geo, are a small, uh, small business. We uh, support the geospatial intelligence community, as earlier mentioned. Um, and we sit at an interesting intersection of both, you know, tip of the spear, tradecraft support, where we have folks on multiple continents at any given time, <clears throat> to where we also have folks sitting in the back of a server doing, you know, enterprise IT support. So when COVID-19 happened, it's kind of like, you know, the, the bomb goes off, everybody stops, okay, now we all have to go home. So we kind of saw what the impacts were on the IT side and the analytics side. Um, a couple of key things that are really where we're starting to see them combine is one, how do we expand enterprise collaboration services? And then two, um, how are we bringing OSINT tradecraft, open source intelligence tradecraft to the forefront? Um, some agencies I think have leaned a little farther forward. Some maybe they're doing it, but it's not necessarily a front and, front and center initiative or activity. Uh, this 
incident in the last two months, I think has put a huge spotlight on that to really be relevant, to really be providing mission impact and really being able to provo- provide that support. Even if you have folks at home, the majority of your workforce, um, you've got to be able to talk and you've got to be able to do, do the mission. Um, you know, right now on this kind of blue goal, 15% staffing, that's really hard to do. So some of the things that, you know, really quickly that we were able to help support, and this was a true testament to, you know, our main customer being NGA, uh, to the government contractor collaboration. Um, we knew that we were about to send thousands of people home. Um, primarily everyone works on a, on a high side classified domain in terms of how they talk, you know, doing WebExes, phone calls, Jabber. Um, chat messaging, things like that. So we had to basically replicate that capability and put that down on the low side. Uh, in about a 10 day time after a, a whiteboard session and a VTC session with several uh, executives, we basically you know, did a, a big time increase to the main trunk line of the phone. We created a WebEx capability for seniors so they could keep continuity of operations and meetings and plannings and every you know putting bids together and keeping them on track to just doing exit and blocking and tackling to support the main you know day-to-day mission um we installed a uh, installed a a jabber um, secure fouo for official use only instance that allows people to communicate on the unclass level uh, we stood that up on the thursday and by the following monday we had over 2,000 concurrent users um and then i think most Importantly, um, for really the executive leadership, somebody like uh, the Admiral gave him a town hall. We set, helped set up a town hall capability that allows the executive staff to reach out to 10,000 plus employees at any given time to uh, to allow them to, um, you know, keep people on track. People, people focus and allows also the Q and A, the interaction, which is a which is a great piece for uh, you know for for any kind of leadership. And then on the where does that need on the OSINT side? So now that we've created this collaboration capability, all right, now we can support mission while folks are you know sitting in their pajamas or their sweatpants at home, still do it, still doing their job. So um, focus on how do we look at uh, expanding uh, OSINT capabilities. We've got a lot of COTS tools that are already in place. Um, I think um, being able to push that to a secure on class environment would be probably the next step we need to start looking as a, at a lot of agencies, but doing that securely and doing that to where data is secured. So um, we are we're kind of in the midst of several projects right now where we're working on that, um, and but very much at a small scale. I think the big push going forward that as a community we would like to see is how are you looking at contract restructure to a sense where the government has. Um, certain percentages they'll do for small business set aside. I think we need to take a hard look at how we do certain percentages for, let's not overly classify work that doesn't need it and partition some of that off as unclassified work. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, downstream impacts, positive impacts that can come of that. But most importantly, as we're seeing now, having that capability that can allow that sustainment of mission while everyone's sent at home, I think has become, you know, front and center. Absolutely. Thank you, Dave. Really appreciate your insight on that. So now we're at the part of the session where we're going to move on to questions. So the first question we've received is for Patrick, and it's from an ODNI representative. Um, the question is, we know how fast and agile Quadrant is at NGA. What other government agencies does Quadrant serve? So in addition to uh, large presence at NGA, we do uh, some work at uh, the NRO. We have, uh, we're doing some enterprise applications work there. We do uh, some enterprise applications work um, up at uh, Fort Meade. Uh, we have a pretty significant presence at uh, FBI. Uh, we also do some work at NGIC as well. Uh, down in Chant- uh, in Charlottesville, we're doing some enterprise cloud migration work there. Um, and then uh, we do have um, a small presence at uh, at Langley uh, in the enterprise applications area. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, now we have another question. They're flowing in, so thank you. Um, this is for John. Adobe has been fairly quiet about all their cool capabilities. Do they do, do they do agile software development, and how are they partnering with other defense contractors? 
Sure. So yes, we, we do do agile uh, development. Um, when we're developing our software, we have a very robust supply chain uh, that goes through a lot of checks and balances. And a lot of our code then is all of our products are hashed so that we can make sure that we know the configuration and release management before when they're on the low side and then move to the high side. Um, but we, you know, from a delivery perspective, we really like to partner with folks um, in, in the mission space who have the customer intimacy. Um, Adobe typically likes to support the technology stack and can help answer those questions. But we really like to partner with, you know, systems integrators, technology, digital transformation consulting firms, because they understand the customer's roadmap. They understand at what points the technology can be inserted and when the customer is ready to do things, as well as the change management around that. Okay, great. Thank you, John. Now, here's another question that we received. What are the core set of collaboration tools you believe are the most productive in today's dynamic environment? So this is for all the panel members. So why don't we start out with Patrick? So I, I would say uh, from a collaboration perspective, I think the two we see the most, we use um, the Microsoft Teams uh, collaboration tool, which I think we find to be um, very effective. Uh, we also see a lot of our partners and um, teammates use uh, Zoom as an effective collaboration tool. Um, some of our uh, folks uh, have a preference for uh, tools like Slack is another one that is uh, pretty pretty effective um, as, a, as a collaboration tool. Um, I think that uh, in the customer space, I think you see a lot more with uh, things like Jabber um, and some of the other um, internal capabilities like that. Uh, but but I think we we generally lean heavily right now on things like Teams and and Zoom and Slack and just the ability to engage. I think that's the probably the biggest thing for us is being remote. I think we're trying to figure out how to be able to engage with people as much as get the work done because people I, there's a worry about people feeling I think isolated at home and um, having the ability to see and reach out and communicate to their coworkers is pretty important. Absolutely. Thank you, Patrick. Um, why don't we move on to John with Adobe? Do you have something you'd like to share with us? Sure. Um, so, so we use a variety of collaboration tools. I'll say from a video conferencing perspective, um, I'm a big fan of Adobe Connect. So we use that internally as well as a lot of customers in the public sector for persistent rooms that can be stood up and that when you come back to a room, um, it will look the same. And so you can basically, you know, from a COVID perspective, we have organizations manning these watch watch centers, you know, 24 by seven collaborating around the world with, you know, Adobe Connect. But from a, from a technology perspective, we use Slack, we use Microsoft Teams. Um, those are really good tools um, to share information, communicate with chat, um, also set, you know, meeting calendars and whatnot for action items. Um, but, you know, one, one of the things that we've started to hear a lot from as well is, you know, the ability just to collaborate on signing documents and the business processes that were maybe on the high side that didn't exist on the low side. And all of a sudden a paper form that, you know, didn't seem too hard to fill out that someone keyed in, all of a sudden they can't get things processed like timesheets and whatnot. Um, and, and so we've seen a lot of customers come forward going, I need the ability to digitally sign a document and then send it through some sort of workflow. And so that's another element of collaboration that I don't think organizations have necessarily really thought through or had an appreciation for kind of before COVID hit. Perfect, thank you. Now we'll move on to Dave. Yeah, um, not really gonna advocate for one technology or the other. Um, I think the most important thing is, is it secure and can it federate? meaning that if you've got other groups with other technologies, you're not being forced into one sort of shoebox. So, um, you know, on the government side for our clients, for our customers, partners, we, we, uh, we've implemented a lot of Cisco technology. Um, and we've also, um, with the, you know, our talented engineers, uh, figured out capabilities to go reach out to other partners, other agencies to allow interagency or uh, sorry, outside agency collaboration, uh, putting essentially a federation layer in between it. So, you know, it, in the end, if you're a Skype for business shop or you're a Microsoft uh, shop or whatever technology, I think the most important thing is to, to make sure that you're enabling your architecture to A, remain secure, but B, 
uh, being able to put those hooks, those tie-ins so that you're not forcing one group or another to divest and to reinvest. So um, there's a significant time savings there and also a cost savings by, uh, by, by doing so. Uh, so when, you know, if, if you're, a, you know, an outside enterprise looking to stand up, you know, within your own company, uh, keep those things in mind inside, at least our partner space, uh, we've been able to lean forward pretty hard on, on ensuring that, hey, you don't have to buy something else, stick with what you have, we'll show you how to tie this Cisco service with this Skype service and everybody can, can communicate and go on, go on about their day. Great, thank you, Dave. Okay, we're getting lots of questions, so this is exciting. Now we'll move on to our next question. Um, this question is for Dave Sterling. As a small company, does Royce Geo participate in SBIR and other initiatives that can help the DOD side? I'm thinking in particular about the Air Force WERX initiative. Okay. Familiar, familiar with the initiative, yes. We, we haven't participated yet. Um, that's obviously uh, uncharted territory, but one that we're not, uh, not fearful to, to go after. So, you know, this year in 2020, we're, we're doing a you know, significant amount of prime bids, white papers, things like that. So that's definitely on our hit list. Okay, great. Thank you. Now, another question. This is for the group. So we'll start off um, with Patrick. Overclassification. How can we help with that? I guess people tend to overclassify. So let me rephrase the question. General Hyten was talking about that earlier this week. How can we help this? So why don't we go out with Patrick? So I think I would say this is an area uh, we are intimately familiar with. I think we deal um, with a lot of systems that uh, work uh, and are enabled in a classified environment uh, by default, just because agencies have put the infrastructure and the capabilities and investment on the high side in the past. Um, and I think uh, we do see a lot of overclassification um, of stuff today. Uh, and I think um, there's a difference in my mind of uh, that we, we don't always or have not traditionally made between we're classifying something because it's actually uh, a classified document as opposed to we say we're classifying something because we just want it to be in a more secure environment. And I think we have to draw the line between those two things to say, hey, we want this to be secure but not classified uh, as opposed to, hey, this is a classified document. I think um, some of the things going on today we see with like CMMC and stuff where we're defining um, more clearly how to handle controlled unclassified information and a lot of the security measures you can put against that. And uh, I think we as uh, system integrators and companies can do a lot better job at making sure that as we build out applications and implement those systems that we're doing the right uh, metadata tagging and that we're, uh, providing capabilities to allow um, agencies to uh, appropriately classify the documents as we as we go through it. So I think it's a it's an issue that um, is a big issue today. I think we see a lot of overclassification just in the past couple months. We work on a lot of enterprise corporate business systems and and we started when we really started digging in on some of the things that we could do on the low side. Um, the answer is, well, we do it on the high side because it's convenient, not because it makes sense or because it has to be on the high side. Gotcha. Okay, great. Now we'll move to John with Adobe Federal. Thank you. Um, so I, I think it is a, it, it's something that really has been brought to the forefront, especially with COVID. Um, you know, I've heard numbers ranging from, you know, 60 to 85% of what is done could, is actually open source and unclassified content. And I think, you know, the, where organizations struggle is, you know, okay, so I bring some content together. Well, this source wasn't classified and this source wasn't classified, but then all of a sudden it becomes sensitive when it's put together in some sort of report. And I think, you know, that's where organizations start to struggle. And I think you have to enable an architecture and an infrastructure that really allows you to control that content. And so that, one, it, the, the content is protected, but you know, if for example, there is a spillage, you can pull that content back or the content when it goes to someone can be shared. 
And so I think there's ways that we can push the envelope, whether it's through, um, you know, digital rights management with a combination of different, you know, technologies like commercial for classified solutions, um, different laptops, um, encrypting the full disk so that you've got basically a perimeter um, or a, dem a defense in depth approach along with kind of a zero trust architecture that really enables people to have confidence in working on the low side. So since if, if information is pulled together that is over classified um, or needs to be classified at a higher level, there's, there's safety nets. Thank you, John. Now we'll move on to Dave. Yeah, and this is uh, one of those questions you could devote a four-hour podcast to everything from, you know, contracts to security and governance to technology to tradecraft best practices. Um, you know, I don't doubt that, honestly, at the end of the day, the technology is there. It totally is uh, to do everything from, you know, passing information high to low, low to high, it's secure. There's a lot of, obviously, security protocols and things that need to be that need, need to be established. Um but from a top down, an agency, whether it's, you know, NGA, whoever needs to kind of put their foot in the ground and, and lean into the position that, look, we are going to make a, a concerted effort to do things in the open environment. Um, you kind of heard me allude to it in the intro. Um, step one is truly look at new acquisitions as they come out. What work can be partitioned out that can be truly unclassified work? We've been seeing this in the last five years on the development and some of the engineering side where they've been, they've allowed, hey, bring in your unclass big data developer because we know these folks are hard to find within the cleared Intel community. Great. So we're, we're able to recruit, you know, commercial guys, commercial guys. Um, second, um, you've got programs that are out there that are traditionally what's called your FTE, you know, here's your hours per person to go sit in a chair and do the support on, you know, on site. Um, there's a lot of really talented analysts that work in that environment. I think we need to look at more of a pure services environment where we're being as industry being uh, rewarded for doing delivery. And that delivery can be a mix of having really agile, smart teams that are doing purely unclassified work, OSINT work, that can be passed into the government space and pushed up to support mission. Um, uh, the, the lot of that that uh, a lot of that work exists today could be done that way. There are certain things. Don't get me wrong; that are going to be purely classified. The end. We we understand that as industry, but there is definitely um, uh, an ability there. I think to start partition partitioning out certain uh, elements that could be handled uh, in a pure contractor space in an unclass environment. And I think there's some great downrange effects to that of better staffing pipelines, better resiliency, uh, better, uh, um, you know, in an event like COVID, obviously now you've got a sustained workforce that's not relying on going into a cleared space. So there's huge downstream benefits to this, but it's got to start at kind of the highest levels and that is going to be you know the agency direction and then next how are the contracts coming out and how are they going to be structured that it's going to allow us to do this kind of support perfect thank you dave okay now for the next question this one is for john are we able to use adobe's watermarking capability or the other things john mentioned in his um other things john mentioned to address classification Yes, so um, we actually integrate with the classification markup tool, but uh, one of the use cases that a lot of customers come to us with are, you know, can you actually watermark a document so that, and watermark it not just across the page, but really anywhere, um, so that a user knows the level or sensitivity of this document and has an idea of the content, right? So if they all of a sudden send it to their, you know, 10 best friends and there's PII information in it, they knew that there was PI information in it. The other element too is also the analytics aspect of um, digital rights management. So you actually know potentially where the content is going um, outside your firewall. So there's analytics that report back on and where it's been opened, IP address. And so you can also then see, you know, is something opening in Europe for some reason? Maybe there's an absolute valid reason um, and, and that, that user has, you know, a mission that's associated with that. But there's a lot of capabilities that are really built in fundamentally to digital rights management, just like, and it works just like you would with Netflix or iTunes. You can download that content, but you can't, you know, copy it or necessarily send it to someone who's not authorized to, to view it. 
Perfect, thank you. So now I'll move on to a question. Um, and actually as moderator, I typically don't like to answer questions, but I believe this one is very important. And um, I did receive a question. Um, the question is, um, Dr. Mendoza, do you plan on taking these companies' initiatives into a guide for the IC and DOD? And the reason why I want to answer that, because I think that's very critical in where we're at in the movie today. Um, my job as the IC chief architect is to bring the community together, shepherd the community so that we can build trusted partnerships toward, towards mission outcomes in a federated environment. What we learned from Epic One of EyeSight is that each agency, DOD and international partner, has their own specific mission goals and objectives. So it doesn't make sense for us to mandate a specific solution. So we bring the community together using the reference architecture framework approach, which is really a systematic process so that we can identify what result are we working to accomplish? What are all the things that we need to do to get there? What recurring problem are we trying to solve? What are the design patterns? What are the implementations? And then a schedule. So bringing the community together to drive the solutions that are needed. So it depends if agencies um, have these solutions and it makes sense to federate them, then we'll go ahead and accomplish that. Um, if it makes sense that we should drive one solution and serve it up in the community shared space, then the community, the DOD and the international partners, whoever has the equities in that will help to drive that. So I hope I helped answer that question. Thank you. So now next question is for everyone. Do you have any lessons learned on low side collaboration tools and platforms that you can share? So why don't we start with Dave this time? Yeah, um, it's easier to install and not in, uh, enable in the midst of a crisis. It's a lot easier to do it in a non-crisis environment. We, uh, we had to do about four, four months worth of work in 10 days. So <laughs> a bit of a rush schedule, but uh, I think that was a, there was a big incentive for us to get it done uh, at, the, at the end of the day. Okay, now let's move to John. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, so I think, you know, um, when you move from a very managed desktop enterprise environment to work from home, where you've got a very heterogeneous environment, you may have some people that have approved telework laptops, some people that right now are working on their personal systems. Um, it really presents a lot of unique challenges because you just have someone's on this different version of Word and someone, you know, for example, hasn't applied this patch. Um, and so you really have to look at solutions that are enterprise grade that but plug into existing open standards out there. For example, our digital rights management works with Adobe Reader. So anyone who has Adobe Reader can open up a protected document if they if they're, have the authentication to do so. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, when you're working with Word, um, you know, some people may not feel comfortable installing a plugin on their on their personal PC or even, hey, I'm doing government work and I'm not even authorized to do that right now. So there's a lot of policy considerations. I think, you know, when you have a, a work environment such as, um, you know, teams uh, that SharePoint based that you can actually have solutions in the background that can seamlessly encrypt a document, whether it's uploaded or downloaded, uh, and then you plug in your authentication system. Um, I, I think that's where things are going to be headed in the future. Um, right now, we're kind of in that awkward stage of, you know, trying to get by and do our jobs. Um, but I do think, you know, the heterogeneous environment, working from home, different networks, you know, present unique challenges. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, now we'll move on to um, Patrick. I think uh, for us, I would say the big lesson learned is, uh, the word I would say is security, right? Uh, that as uh, I think John mentioned, you are dealing with a lot of people with hetero heterogeneous devices, and I think um, I think we found even with our customers uh, and with uh, our corporate, uh, we've got to make sure that we have um, the level of security and and that we we build a um, we build out a collaboration environment, and I would say uh, the, a communications environment maybe that people can connect uh, securely. Um, and I think we're still, I feel like we're still a little bit um, lacking there. Uh, you know, uh, you know, we were reactive. I know NGA is a particular example, they leaned in, but 
you know, they had to go out and buy uh, lots of CAC readers and ask contractors to go out and buy CAC readers to get people access. Or, um, you know, we still wrestle on the corporate side with a good um, authentication and integrated identity management solution that allows us to work um, across the different uh, uh, tools. I think that's an area where um, we could put more time and effort going forward to develop um, better solutions. Because I think we can't assume that everybody's going to have a secure laptop or that everybody's home network is not going to be running some sort of uh, open source um, uh, software on it. We have to figure out how to deal deal with that that security piece. I think that's probably the biggest um, issue and lesson learned. And I think that's still an evolving problem. I think there's um, we're making progress there. And I think we're certainly a lot more secure than we were before. Um, and hopefully we're staying one step in front of the adversary. But I think, um, you know, now that the adversary sees what we're doing, uh, they're going to be um, looking for ways to penetrate. So we need to be aggressive in that in that arena. Absolutely. Thank you, Patrick. Okay, now we're going to move on to the, our next question. This one's for the group. Do any of these companies view their initiatives as short term? Do your customers expect things to revert or sustain? So why don't we start with Dave this time? Um, I think anybody thinking in the short term might be missing the bigger picture here. Um, you know, something like this and it could happen again next year. It could happen 10 years from now. The one thing that we've learned is that we need to be prepared. Uh, nobody wants to go through this fire drill again of having to get communications and figure out how to work from home and, and, and keep folks either busy or figure out how to pick up pick, pick up the pieces of, of keeping that mission continuity and being able to still sustain and uh, operations. Um, we're moving forward with kind of leaning in and say, hey, let's take this capability, let's figure out how to harden this and how to make it even more enterprise and more scalable over time and actually do more of the federation integration piece with, uh, with other agencies. Um, and I think more than anything, we're showing that we need to start looking how we do business. And this is, speaks for the classified customers. How do, we, how do we expand our business outside the secure space? Um, I know I can speak for NGA, for example, they're taking leaning really hard in on the uh, on the new campus in St. Louis. They're going to build multiple floors that are going to be completely unclassified, which is great. So that they're they're being proactive and looking at how do you take an entire campus and, and, and pivot to that to that role. But I think overall for a lot of different, whether it's commands, agencies, whoever, uh, they need to really look at how they, especially on the tradecraft side of the house, how they expand uh, and get beyond the uh, the SCIF environment. And then from a technology standpoint, how do we get that information back in? <clears throat> Perfect. Thank you, Dave. John, how about your perspectives? Thank you. Um, yeah, I think, you know, you always sometimes need a forcing function to really look at how you do business. And I think COVID has really provide, provided that, you know, before it was like, well, what happens if there was a snow day, you know, or six days of snow and we couldn't get to the office and how would we muddle through that? Well, this is like three months of a long snow day, right? And where I like to take it is, you know, from a strategic perspective, what should we be doing for the workforce? You know, are there things that we should be doing in terms of reaching a greater population that can work in this space that maybe everything doesn't have to be at a high classification level? Can we, you know, gain access to a broader workforce? From a, from a technology company perspective, you know, I've been in conversations, um, you know, around the Beltway with people hiring folks, and they've actually pivoted to where before they would have to hire right in inside the national um, capital region to, you know, looking at folks in North Carolina and South Carolina because they have the right skill sets that are needed to do that. And so I think this is, quite frankly, my personal perspective here to stay. Um, I think you know, since this has happened, I probably had been busier and had more meetings with folks because we're not, you know, going around the beltway. Um, we're not, you know, moving from one meeting to the other where we have to block time. And so it's really freed up and really kind of enabled a work-life balance for folks. My kids, I have three kids, they're zooming away right now. Um, my wife's a school teacher. So, you know, that's a challenge, but I think it's brought a 
you know, a nice work-life balance um, and a different pace to life that probably some of us have been looking for, but just haven't been able to do. So. Great. Thank you, John. Um, Patrick, you're next. Thanks. I think uh, that we are absolutely uh, planning for the this to be a transformative event. You know, I think there's a there's a couple different areas that I think we we are talking to our customers about and talking internally about. Certainly, um, the notion of just doing more on the low side, which we've all talked about, uh, and I think there's the notion. You know, we do a lot of software development work. Uh, a lot of that, a lot more of that initial development can be done on the low side and moved high before you're putting the data in there that might make it classified. Um, so there's a lot more capability there. I think we also need to look at um, things like, uh, you know, John mentioned developers in, in, in North Carolina or South Carolina, but I think it's also having a, a distributed geographic uh, workforce is something we need to consider more of from the standpoint of if you look at, imagine if you're a company that only is based in New York or New Jersey and you know they get um, o- overrun, I guess for lack of a better word, with, with this issue uh, where you have a folks in a different part of the country that um, might not be as affected or be affected at different times. I think we need to look at more of that and we need to encourage, uh, as Dave mentioned earlier, our, uh, contract, um, flexibility uh, going forward, where I think uh, probably the biggest thing, and agencies leaned in, I really applaud all the contracting officers I know we've dealt with, but but I think having more flexibility in contracts going forward to deal with, hey, we, 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 we can work offsite. You know, some of the contracts we had didn't have offsite requirements, so we had to make, you know, adjustments in the, the contract documents and stuff like that. And those are types of things that we need to work on um, uh, addressing. I also think, you know, we need to get a little more creative about things like, and we, we, we have a population of people that needs to be on site and we still have in, in my, in my company, I know I'm sure Dave's got folks and, and, uh, other companies have folks that have to go into to the customer sites every day, uh, just because there are pieces of work that can't be done in an unclassified environment. So how do we do things like, um, shift work or, uh, you know, be flexible with um, work schedules and, and stuff like that. And then, you know, even in our corporate office, we're having the discussion about um, how much telework and if we were to bring back people to the office, you know, we have a little bit of an open concept in our office for where people sit. How do you deal with um, kind of social distancing and stuff like that? And I think I think you have to plan for the long haul, um, and 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 I think we, we're we're thinking this is not a hey you know in two weeks we're all going to be back in the office and this is magically going to go away. I think it's a little bit of a a nine eleven type event where you know you never have the same airport experience after nine eleven. I think we're not going to have the same work experience after this event. Uh, hopefully it'll be um, better. I think. Uh, you know, as we figure out ways to move forward. All good points. Thank you, Patrick. And actually, that's a perfect segue into our next question. So this is for the group. As you know, the 911 commissioner's report pointed out that agencies weren't sharing data. How has that changed to help enable workforce innovation? So why don't we start out this Patrick this time? So I, I would say it's probably certainly better, right, than it was uh, years ago. But I still think um, there's work to be done uh, there. I think just in the example of um, some of the guidance and stuff that we were dealing with around things like the CARES Act and other stuff, I think other agencies were providing uh, individual guidance um, and I think that's an example where I think there could be more collaboration a, a, among the agencies. I think we see agencies do have different tool sets um, to do different things. And I think they're still wrestling with the ability to um, connect everything uh, on, the high, on the high side, let alone in this new unclassified 
environment. So um, I, I think it's better, but I think yeah, there's my opinion is there's still a lot of work to be done in this in this area moving forward. Thank you, Patrick. Yes, always a lot of work to do. Um, now let's move on to John and get your perspectives on this question. I really echo what Patrick's sentiments there. I think, you know, they've done some great work, but I think COVID-19 uh, and this work from home has really pushed the ability to share the, what information uh, people can to a whole new level because um, is there a policy enabling work from home right now? For some organizations, yes, others, no. Um, does it trickle down to the entire workforce, including contractors? Not sure. Um, but I think, you know, what we often find is there's some great, you know, point technically savvy solutions out there. But, you know, we're struggling from an environment that's very hybrid and heterogeneous where you've got information that's on someone's laptop. You have information that's an on-premise, you know, server farm to information that's in the cloud. And you really need a solution that can transcend a lot of those different environments and a lot of those different end user endpoints. So you have a seamless experience like you do from a, from a Netflix perspective. So I think there's more information that should be being shared. It might not being shared, it may be being shared insecurely today, or it just might not be, be being shared. So I think there's a lot we could be doing to enable work from home. Perfect, thank you, John. Okay, now let's move on to Patrick. Oh, I'm sorry, Dave. Dave. Dave, sorry about that. I give you the question twice. Yeah, okay, I'm, Dave. I'm not going to say a whole lot that hasn't been echoed. Yeah, there, there's a willingness to share because just, you know, the nature of certain agencies, commands, whatever it may be, and then there's technology. And I think the one thing we found out to, uh, to John's earlier comments is that, um, you know, pe people want to share. It's just do we have the right technology stack in place to allow them to do that? Uh, unlike 9-11, uh, on, on September 12th, uh, most folks were still able to go into work uh, or the 13th or 14th, where this, when, you know, everything kind of shut down on the 13th, a lot of folks, you know, 80 plus percent of, say, our agency was, was sent home. So they couldn't readily go back to their high side workstation to do that sharing. So um, this almost has, um, from, a, from an information sharing collaboration standpoint, been much more challenging because we've had to play catch up to get uh, certain technologies in place and kind of alluding back to your previous question you know is it short term or long term if anything um from a from a sharing standpoint this should be a long-term play to help put in that solid infrastructure and look at from this point forward how are we going to do our business if we've got six days of snow we have covid we have an earthquake whatever um, we're still going to be able to persist and maintain, not just kind of be an agency or a command on life support and just doing the first phase type stuff, but how are we really going to do a full level of operation no matter where uh, folks are at? Obviously, you still have security concerns to balance and, and juggle, and that will always exist as it should. Um, but I, I think we we have the opportunity to, to, to do more uh, based in the, in the current, if we were to be in this environment again. <clears throat> Great, thank you so much, Dave. Okay, so we've received excellent questions. Now here's our last questions for the group. All of these companies seem to work with NGA. Do any of them have a presence in St. Louis? Are they looking at the potential for unclassified work in the new facility based upon what former director Cardillo proposed? So why don't we start out with Patrick? So uh, I am sitting in St. Louis today. Uh, so we uh, we have a presence in St. Louis. I'm actually based out of St. Louis, and uh, we have a, a, a significant portion of our workforce is in St. Louis. And uh, before uh, COVID struck, I was uh, regularly commuting to D.C. So um, we are uh, actively engaged um, in looking at um, how we can uh, work on uh, initiatives around New Campus East and uh, I think we as a company are making a pretty heavy investment in um, St. Louis moving forward. So absolutely. Perfect. Thank you, Patrick. John, how about you? So uh, both my wife and myself are from St. Louis. So uh, uh, anytime we get to go back, probably not in the near future, but uh, I don't know if you can see above my shoulder, the uh, St. Louis Cardinals from the World Series uh, pennant there. So big St. Louis fan. Um, and you know, St. Louis is a great uh, Midwest city. 
that's probably struggled a lot with the pivot towards bigger cities. Um, you know, low cost of, of living there, great schools. And so uh, anytime that I can do work with organizations that are in St. Louis, whether it's from academia to government organizations to commercial businesses, as well as small businesses, um, I, I look to do so. So St. Louis has got a warm place in my heart. Perfect. Thank you, John. Now we move on to Dave. Yeah, so we uh, we have about half of the company footprint in St. Louis. So before COVID, it was kind of a you know home away from home. Spent a lot of time going out there, and uh, yeah, in terms of you know the growth, um, you know our former director uh, Robert Cardillo, who I know is is being uh, very engaged and involved in the expansion and growth. Um, you know, we too are kind of following the lead of a lot of other seniors that that are are, are shaping the new environment of, of St. Louis. And I think uh, with the new building, um, we saw in the East 10 years ago when they consolidated everything to the new campus. I think there was just huge benefits across the board that most folks would agree with. Um, I see that same sort of ripple effect happening in, in hopefully uh, downtown in the next three to four years when they finally do move in. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a huge, uh, huge geographic place of importance for us, for sure. <clears throat> thank you, Dave. Well, thank you so much for all the questions. So in closing, I'd like to say thank you so much for your time. And we're definitely grateful to our panelists for sharing their knowledge and wisdom around workforce innovation enabling new environments, also known as hashtag work from home. Thank you, Patrick, John, and Dave, and everyone have a great rest of your day. And thank you, Adam, for hosting this. Over and out.